Um, hi and um, good evening. Thanks for registering for um, this evening's session. Um, hopefully we can talk about uh, uh, things that are of interest and uh, pass on some useful information. Um, it's a, quite a big topic and um, I just want to convey some of my own personal thoughts and educate on uh, some of the issues that we will um, commonly see runners in particular. So just to introduce myself, my name is Mark Jackson. Um, I work as a consultant orthopedic surgeon um, and now predominantly a sole knee specialist. Um, um, so I get uh, referrals from across the country and um, predominantly through general practitioners, physiotherapists, A&E departments and other surgeons. And this can involve treating and assessing patients of all ages right from the age of 12 up to, well, there's no upper limit really, so often seeing patients well into their 80s and 90s. Um, children who are under the age of 12 uh, tend to obviously be looked after more through the paediatric um, system. Um, so I'm based predominantly here in the sports surgery clinic, also work a little bit in the Black Rock Clinic, um, but my practice is then split pretty much down the middle between looking after patients with sports related injuries and issues, sometimes we call these soft tissue injuries, and those that are more degenerative in nature, which um, for the main means uh, problems of uh, arthritis. So uh, just to go through a few aims of today's talk, clearly uh, we'd all like to look like the, the runner on the right here, um, but I just want to give you some basic anatomy um, so that we can understand the common conditions that we deal with, uh, go through some of the more frequent conditions that I tend to see uh, in the running population, uh, explain that often what a role of a knee surgeon can be um, and give you then a, talk, a walk through and a talk of some examples of patients I've seen in the last few weeks. Then just finally a few general tips and advice uh, for people out there who are currently running or perhaps wondering about their injury. So just some very simple anatomy and anatomy is key to any surgeon's life and uh, we need to know this in a lot of detail. But just basically, uh, if we look at the picture on the left hand side here, this is a picture of a knee from the front with obviously all the skin and fat removed. Um, and we can see a few things that uh, we may just touch upon today. So the top is the muscle, the quads muscle, quad meaning four. So there are four bellies of muscle, if you like, that blend together to form a quadriceps tendon that uh, is seen uh, in this area here, blending onto the top of your kneecap. And then below the kneecap is the patella tendon attaching onto the uh, top of your shin bone here in the tibia. And this whole area is called the extensor mechanism, a very, very common source of pain um, in runners. The iliotibial band we hear an awful lot about, and that's this structure here, um, but it extends a lot higher than this, right up all the way up towards the pelvis. And if we look at the structures then on the right with a lot of the muscular and uh, soft tissues now removed, we're going to be seeing the bones, which as we've mentioned, the tibia being the shin bone, the femur, which is your thigh bone. The kneecap here is uh, the patella is reflected out of the way just for the picture. And now we can see the joint surfaces, which are usually very smooth um, and low friction. We see ligaments in the middle. So we hear a lot about this um, fella here, the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament. And then in between the bones, there are these things called the meniscal cartilages. And you've got one on each side of the joint. Um, and we'll touch upon a few of these issues um, um, as we go along. So again, if we look at these pictures, this picture now on the left-hand side of the screen, it's just a dissected cadaver cadaveric specimen um, with the knee opened up. So again, we see the joint surface here, this lovely smooth glistening uh, surface. This area here under what's the LFC, so this is the lateral side of the knee, the lateral femoral condyle, this is how it should look. On the inside of the knee, on the medial femoral condyle, there is a patch here of some wear developing. Not too bad, but it's certainly happening in this specimen. And the ligaments in the middle. If we were to put a camera in the joint down here and have a look, this is what the viewers we get in our keyhole surgery procedures. So this is called an arthroscopy. And the camera there shows us the meniscus here sitting wedged in between the surfaces. And again, in this example here, this is completely normal with lovely white, smooth, uh, uh, articular joint surfaces. And then the last picture here on the right-hand side, again, um, shows how these meniscal cartilages, one here and one here, are wedged in and interposed between the weight-bearing portions of the joint. And it is important just to understand the differences when we talk about the term cartilage. 
The meniscal cartilage is what is often referred to as a torn cartilage. So if someone says they tore a cartilage, they're referring to these things here, the meniscal cartilages. The joint surface cartilage, we often refer to as chondral or articular cartilage. And that's these white smooth surfaces. So half my work, as we mentioned, is a lot of sports related issues and soft tissue injuries. And just to give you a few pictures here, the top three pictures of keyhole surgeries looking after meniscal cartilage damage. So here is a tear, and this is when we've removed it. Here we're doing some stitching and repair of a cartilage, and things can get quite complicated. And we tend to sometimes offer this in very specific indications and in sports injuries only. The bottom three pictures is a maybe more then of the ligamentous type work that we might have to deal with, with the middle picture at the bottom being a very typical torn ACL or anterior cruciate ligament. And once we've cleaned it out, and we're putting a new one in for patients who are desiring a return to their sports in particular, it would look like this. So this would be a before picture and an after picture when we've reconstructed and made a new ligament here. And then finally, this last picture on the left um, is when we have to do open surgery for very complex injuries when somebody has uh, essentially dislocated their knee and tore apart lots of these structures we're talking about. Then the other half of the work will be the more degenerative and arthritic um, problems and uh, just a few examples here of what we might end up having to do for people. Top left, this are the two components of what we call a partial or half knee replacement. This is a full total knee replacement. This would be somebody who's having to undergone another knee replacement. So this is a revision total knee replacement. And this is a procedure called an osteotomy. So this is a younger person with arthritis that we're trying to delay um, this, this individual um, getting a knee replacement. But don't assume all these people are old. Plenty of these patients uh, I see are in their 40s and 50s. And uh, it's not infrequently that we're doing knee replacements on people in that age group. Most, however, are going to be into their 60s and 70s. So how common um, is a runner's knee injury? Well, the answer is extremely common. So you go to any race, you're going to see people like in these pictures all taped up, wearing straps, wearing bandages. And uh, this article here um, is from the American Journal of Sports Medicine, which is probably our most respected um, journal within orthopedic surgery and sports uh, sciences and looked at a two year study on 300 runners who were initially uninjured and followed them up prospectively over two years. They were aged between 80 and 60, so 18 and 60, and running for at least uh, 10 miles per week. And at least one overuse injury was sustained in two thirds of these individuals over that two year period, with at least half of those individuals getting more than one injury. The knee was the commonest site of injury, with again almost 30% uh, of all those injuries being at the knee. And the patellofemoral region of the joint, uh, which we've mentioned being the extensor mechanism, uh, was the most common. The most frequent group that were injured were the amateur and inexperienced um, athletes, um, the female sex, and the middle aged runner. <clears throat> so if you picked up an injury, you have a problem, what tends to happen next? Um, people will discuss usually with friends, their family, maybe some fellow runners, have people had similar experiences and what did they do? Next step might now be for people to pick up their mobile phone, type things into Dr. Google um, and see what their advice is there online. Maybe they decide to take a break from running for a bit and see what happens, perhaps the physiotherapist, maybe some treatment has begun. Um, if things go well and things settle down, fine. But if not, maybe then it's taken further. Maybe a sports doctor gets involved. Maybe patients go straight to their GP. And then obviously orthopedic surgeons can become um, involved too. Um, so I would see patients sometimes referred directly to myself, um, straight from a physiotherapist or even self-referrals. Uh, or sometimes we're the very last people to be involved because everything else has already been tried, uh, tested, and maybe has failed. And when I do see patients, nearly everybody I see is going to have had an MRI scan. Um, and that certainly helps me to give uh, the individual um, the best uh, diagnosis I can possibly give them and give them a, a guide to what the best treatment options going forward are likely to be. So what are the common conditions? Uh, we won't go into this in too much detail. Um, these issues here are very, very common. Um, the tendon type pains, so the quadriceps tendon, 
the patella tendon and the hamstrings. And these are issues are also uh, commonly seen. They can be, however, divided up a bit more simply into two groups. We have the overloading and overuse type injuries, and we have the degenerative type problems and injuries. The overload injuries are a bit different. They tend to be fine. They tend to resolve as long as appropriate um, treatments are initiated, which generally are non-surgical. And these then can be reversed with most individuals attaining a good outcome. They are also in the main preventable. Um, this picture here just shows you know, a schematic picture of uh, the patella tendon being inflamed, patella tendonitis being a very common condition. The degenerative issues, however, are a bit different. These are irreversible and need a little bit more careful management and advice. Surgery can occasionally play a role. Is degenerative change inevitable? Yes and no. Some people are lucky and they escape and they don't seem to get too many problems, but everyone gets older, everybody's going to get grey hair and wrinkles and I'm afraid people's joints do start to show the strains of uh, the ageing process. Um, some just get it a bit earlier in life than others or more obviously than others. So what is overload and overuse? Well it, it can begin really with the, some risk factors. Those are going to be usually patients who have in some inadequate strength or strength imbalances. Maybe they have quite poor running biomechanics and uh, some inappropriate training regimes. Um, and then there becomes this imbalance. And it's the imbalance between what the body can cope with and respond to what it can heal and against the load that's being delivered. And if there is too much load and the body can't respond to it and heal and um, become accustomed to that new pressures and loads, then there is this imbalance and overload problems can begin. The majority, as we've said, are manageable without surgery, and most then will have no long-term consequences with, with regards to the development then of osteoarthritis. But it is important to have somebody guiding uh, individuals, taking on board advice from experienced therapists, and the sports medicine doctor or GP can sometimes help out, and sometimes investigations uh, are necessary and injections are necessary. Maybe we need to rule out other pathology. Is there an issue with the spine? Is there an issue with the hip? Are there rheumatological conditions? Um, so there are sometimes further investigations that are warranted, but for most, um, that isn't going to be necessary. So what is my role um, as a surgeon? Well, I can be good cop and I can be bad cop. Um, we need to obviously assess the condition. We need to usually take a good history, we'll examine the knee um, and see what we find. Help then come to a diagnosis. Interpretation of the imaging and giving this context. Um, the radiological reports vary in quality from around the country and from uh, radiologist to radiologist. And it is really just detailing what is seen on the scan. And uh, as we say, we don't necessarily treat the scan, we treat the man. So we have to put it in context for individuals and in explaining what is relevant and what isn't relevant. Um, hopefully, though, we are able to then guide people and get them back and keep them running. And if we do that, um, generally, then that's the good cop side of things. Um, however, we also sometimes have to advise on realistic expectations, bring people back down to earth a little bit, and also counsel on the potential long-term issues. And some of my role, as well as being a surgeon, which is obviously what we train to do and what we enjoy, a lot of it can sometimes be a bit of counselling um, and uh, advising that it's time to perhaps stop running. So the challenge uh, that we face sometimes in a runner's knee is that uh, both of us see it um, differently, but we have very similar goals. We both want people to be active, uh, want people to stay involved in the things that they enjoy doing, um, but we also don't want to do this at the uh, behest of having long-term problems. So the runner I see is often very anxious about having some time out, wants to obviously improve their symptoms and their pain. And some patients are often incredibly surprised if they've picked up an injury. Um, there's often an expectation that we're going to be able to fix everything and have a very quick fix for it. You know, maybe saying, I have a race coming up in four weeks. I've committed to do a triathlon in Barcelona in uh, two months' time. Um, and we also get a lot of individuals currently in the current day and age uh, stating that they want to be able to keep running because it's so important for their mental health. From a surgeon's perspective, um, I need to make a diagnosis, I need to know what I can offer somebody and clearly want to give that person the best route possible to their highest possible function. But we do have that responsibility too 
that um, we don't want people to damage themselves um, irreversibly um, and uh, warn of potential implications that can occur down the line. So there are, I don't want to offend anybody here obviously, but um, there are some challenging runners out there. Um, and the retired sportsman or woman um, who is a keen runner can be a difficulty. They may have picked up quite a few issues in the past. Um, they may have had crucial ligament injuries, they may have had reconstructions, they could have had cartilage surgery from their teens and in their twenties, and this is now catching up with them. And that can be sometimes difficult to take. The runner who's constantly injured, going from one injury to another, from their groin injury to their heel injury to their knee injury. Again, these are difficult and challenging people often don't have quick fixes and aren't necessarily sometimes taking on board some of the perhaps preventative me measures um, that can be um, instigated. The overweight runner, again, a bit of a challenge, putting a lot of pressure and force on joints. Um, and running, in my experience, um, for people who are overweight isn't necessarily the best way to control weight, certainly not in the long term. And there's usually a lot of other things that should take priority um, with regards to diet and lifestyle over just being out running. The runner who has a physical job can be a challenge. Somebody who's on a construction site all day, someone who's farming, who is very heavy on their knees and then expects to be able to run that evening and over the weekend doing long distances. That can be quite a difficult knee to manage. The inexperienced and new runner, often in their middle ages, um, they can be difficult because they're coming into things maybe with a very poor baseline of fitness and they're enjoying their new running and they're feeling the benefits of uh, being out and about and being healthy and active. Um, and then get somewhat surprised when they run into difficulty and have knee complaints and issues that can't easily be fixed. And then there is the perpetual knee abuser, somebody who isn't listening to the advice, is getting sore, sore in knees, keeping on going, has an operation, keeps on going, has another operation, keeps on going. Um, but eventually, you know, usually the penny does drop and, um, and people come to terms with their um, challenges. So as a surgeon, one of my roles is clearly who needs surgery. Um, and actually for runners, it's relatively few, but there are some specific indications that we can sometimes help with. But as we've said, the majority of injuries uh, in runners can be resolved with a good diagnosis and expertise from, in a rehabilitation program. And we do need to have some realistic expectations though, and patience is very important as the change in strength, the changing of biomechanics takes time. Um, and this is not necessarily just measured with a few physio sessions over a week or two. This can take months and months and uh, it does often require motivation and dedication. So just to go through a few um, surgical examples of patients I've recently looked after. This is a very um, elite level runner, in fact, um, hoping to make the qualifying times for 1500 metres for this year's Olympics for, for Ireland and was referred with symptoms of mechanical nature in running symptoms of locking and jamming. And it's overall, it's fairly unusual to see elite level runners with knee problems. Um, so you know, it's a somewhat unusual referral, um, but he had a very clear problem. He had a condition with osteochondritis desiccans. Um, and what we can see here in the keyhole surgery is me retrieving a loose body that was floating around in the joint. And this has been generated off the joint surface here. And when it moves around in the joint like this, it can get pinched and caught. Um, but as soon as it's removed, um, the symptoms resolve. And he made a very quick, rapid recovery and was back running um, uh, within maybe I think it was within about three or four weeks uh, and is now back up to speed and back on track again, hopefully, um, for his goals going forward. Um, this again is a common uh, presentation. 41-year-old um, recreational runner, has a physical job, there was no injury, came on gradually and steadily, but he's now got to the point where he's had to stop running pain is interfering with life, maybe sleep, maybe he's waking at night and he's limping. Um, when we put the camera in the knee, this is the, the problem. This is a tear here in the, in the meniscus in between the joint surfaces. However, the rest of his knee is perfect. This is the other half of his knee with a normal meniscus, normal joint surfaces. These surfaces are normal. So when we take out the tear, which is what this picture is here, so this is the before picture, and this is the after picture, because the rest of his knee is normal, again, he can have a very good outcome. Indeed, he did and got back into things and settled very quickly. This is a similar type of issue in that there is a meniscal cartilage tear. It is a bit different. It's more degenerative. 
Um, and again, we can clean this up. And so this is taken to this, but the difference in this case is that there is some joint surface damage starting. So we have to take this a little bit more cautiously because there is the propensity for this to still cause a few issues and pains. And if this progresses over the next few years, then um, it could be more challenging for that individual to stay involved in these kind of impact and running type activities. And as is often the way, there are similar symptoms also developing on his other knee. This would be uh, an overload problem. Again, a recreational run, and we've seen quite a lot of that in the last 18 months with people perhaps doing more running than normal and increasing the load, running more days, maybe running more frequently, maybe running for longer distances. Um, and this is a reaction in the bone. So on this MRI scan, this is a view of the knee from the front. So this is the femur, the thigh bone, the tibia here. And in this bit of bone, you can see a white pattern. This is a side view showing the same pattern in the bone. And what this represents is bone stress, bone bruising, if you like, or bone edema. Um, and this is indicative that this bone isn't enjoying this new load and is reacting because it isn't getting a chance to heal. This though is in the background of a knee that otherwise looks good. So again, if this is rested and protected, the bone will heal, the symptoms will usually subside, but it can take time. And this type of condition can sometimes take at least three months, sometimes longer, before we allow that person to then start to up their load and increase the, um, the running again. And in the background, need to be seeing a physiotherapist to be working on their strength and seeing if there are some preventative measures that can be put in place before that person returns into their design activity. This then gets a little bit more challenging because this is now significant arthritis at a young age. This individual again has been a regular runner over a good few years and seems to remember there was an old hurling injury probably tore his ACL ligament, um, but didn't need any surgery at that stage. But he's now at the point where on the scan that this is a very worn out joint. And when the camera is put inside the knee, there are areas of bare bone rubbing on bare bone. So this is now 100% game over for this individual. This, they have to accept that there is no good fix for this and that running is unrealistic. Um, but however, there should be other activities we can get this person into, the gym, the bike, um, cross trainers, uh, weight training um, and we can then hopefully maintain some good function over the years but we'll have to accept there are more major surgeries down the line and we need to delay these for as long as we can. Somebody who's a bit overweight and running as we've mentioned can be a challenge so this individual weighs 120 kilos and is using running as his way to control his weight however now he's getting arthritis in and underneath the kneecap here on the scan. He also has a poor program of running, very poor basics and is weak. So this is very vulnerable to progress and it won't be long before other areas of his knee also catch up and start to wear down. This is not again a surgical case, this is just about education, telling people what's going on, interpreting the scan and giving the expectations going forward. And again this individual needs to now look at alternative ways to control weight um, as opposed to the impact of, to activities and running. Um, one final case again, premature osteoarthritis again in a very active individual in their 40s who has been heavily involved in doing triathlons and long distance running over about a 10 year period. And this is on the background of having a previous cartilage surgery um, about 10 years ago. These are both of the knees. The right knee here is bone on bone with a stress reaction again and bone edema. And on the left knee, less advanced changes. But this right knee in particular is in big trouble. This left knee may settle down. But you know, this gentleman has persisted with his running despite being sore, hasn't really listened to his knees. And by the time he comes to get attention and uh, be reviewed, things have really um, moved on. And again, this is an individual who will probably need um, treatments down the line and it is a matter of now delaying uh, this for as long as we can. And then we get the serial knee abuser. So this would be somebody who's very vulnerable to getting uh, problems, a daily runner, someone who every single day goes out running without rest and does nothing else. Um, and has been aware of symptoms over time, but is now getting worse. Still running though, determined to keep running, not prepared to take time out and rest. And as well as the run, we'll often walk 10 kilometers a day. So what's happening now is that this person is getting more arthritis again, similar to the overweight uh, case we just discussed, where the kneecap is wearing out over the front of the joint. But there's also a stress reaction and a stress fracture here in the, uh, in the inner side of the knee. So again, although this may settle and improve, 
if she doesn't do this, this can deteriorate quite quickly into a much more significant arthritic problem. So again, education, not necessarily surgery. So a few um, hard truths about osteoarthritis. Um, it's, uh, it's obviously great that uh, our life expectancy and things has improved, but it does bring with it the challenges of uh, osteoarthritis. And we as yet don't have good medical treatments. So this graph at the bottom right hand side shows how the rates of, uh, as we say here, the prevalence of arthritis in percentage terms is rising through the age groups. So at 40, at 50, at 60, at 70, and at 80. So at the age of, say, 70, 40% of the population have screened for some osteoarthritis and we'll, we'll, we'll find that, that that's the case. Now, prevalence is different to symptoms. A lot of these people still may be relatively unaware of their symptoms. But if we MRI or X-ray people, there are these findings that are developing. And we can see here the significant increase risk and prevalence in women as compared to men. So everybody there has an individualized risk. We are not all the same. Um, there are clear risk factors. Um, we've touched upon a few here, age and uh, whether male or female. But the other risk factors here, which are independent, are obesity. Um, which plays a massive role now in the patients we see with arthritis at a younger age and also those that have had significant prior injuries. And then things we can't do much about, genetics. You know, you can follow your favourite football team and find that there are players who are just constantly being injured and some that seem to go through a massively long career without ever picking up much of an injury. Um, and a lot has to do with genetics. How are your limbs lined up? What are the shape of your bones and joints? How is your collagen made up? What are your ligaments like? Are you somebody who's very naturally loose jointed, which can lead to problems? Are you somebody who's very tight jointed, which can lead to problems? What are you, are you a responder to training? People respond differently. Some people's muscle hypertrophy comes very easy, some doesn't. And what are your muscle types? And there's lots of genetic factors um, that will probably play into osteoarthritis in itself, some of which we still don't uh, really understand. And we have to remember that surgical treatments for arthritis are often significant and in general are not going to be um, procedures that are going to allow patients to return into their running um, activity. So to, to get towards the end of the talk here, my top 10 tips here for runners would be to stay active, but don't just do running. To get stronger, get some resistance training going and maybe get a good rehab person to evaluate and improve your technique. Please don't try and use running as your primary weight control measure. There are other things you can do. And it is important to recognize that the running may not continue forever or you may pick up an injury. So you do need alternative ways. Similarly, um, don't rely purely on the running to manage mental health issues. This is clearly a complicated matter. Um, but if you suddenly find you're out of running for a period of time, um, that can obviously add into anxiety and mental health uh, concerns. It's good to get to know an experienced physiotherapist. Usually, unfortunately, there aren't quick fixes or miracle cures. And it is important for individuals to accept that sometimes time out is necessary to try and recover and rehabilitate. And you need to listen to some of the warning signs of irreversible joint damage. So in the main, that's gonna be a lot of swelling, after activity, stiffness and pain. And if these things are happening, please don't ignore and get somebody to interpret these uh, uh, symptoms for you. However, if all feels good, and you're managing your load well and you're training well, it's fine to continue and people will continue running well into their 40s, 50s, 60s and sometimes beyond. Um, but it's not for everybody at that age group and we just have to be realistic. Uh, in general, even though I'm a surgeon um, and it's what we enjoy doing in, in a way and what we're trained to do, surgery uh, can often be avoided um, and it can be a slippy slope. You don't want to just be looking for quick surgical fixes and find within a few years things have got a lot harder to manage. So in summary, um, we, we all have the same goals. We want people to be active. We want them to be healthy and enjoy their sports. Um, most of these conditions that runners will present to us with are not going to necessarily um, be going straight into anything uh, surgical. And I do encourage you to listen to your knee symptoms. Get them checked out if you're concerned. Um, commit then to some prevention measures, um, which you know, will involve some you know, alterations perhaps in your training. And accept that unfortunately injuries are common and um, oh, it's relatively common and you may need on occasion to have a break and some time out. So I hope that makes sense and I uh, hope people have picked up one or two things and uh, many thanks for your attention and um, 
hopefully if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to try and uh, address those for you. Many thanks. <laughs>